Hey, I just wanted to give everyone an update of what I've been up to lately, and it's legacy thin client hacking. I've been wanting to get Windows 98 onto a couple of old thin clients from a standard external CD-ROM drive, standard parallel ATA. But unfortunately, this HP T5700, this T5510, and this, I believe it's a uh, T5710, I think this one and this one are are related and this one is the misfit outcast we'll get into that later but the problem is that these thin clients don't like to natively boot off of an ide cd rom drive because well they're never going to have one they natively want to boot off of usb so installing linux or you know xp and above would be really easy you know vista windows 10 windows 7 well windows 10 would run like crap seeing how you know we're running like a one gigahertz and 800 megahertz uh via processor if I, if I remember correctly so goal get windows 98 for dos legacy gaming on some old legacy hardware but the problem is windows 98 does not have the ability to install via usb so before we even begin we have quite a few technical problems one how the hell do we fit a hard drive in here now if you notice this guy has what we call a riser kit uh, I call those fat clients. Um, what the riser does is it allows like a PCI or a PCI Express expansion inside, but it also allows us more room for a standard st size hard drive. Inside this guy, however, we have to use a 1.8 inch hard drive. We'll uh, move this guy aside for a little bit later. But let's go to the desk and I'll start doing a little bit of explaining. Okay. So when you have a thin client, they're going to come with a disk on module. And what these disk on modules are just 44 pin IDE capable drives. Okay. Uh, most of the ones that I've pulled so far do not break 512 megs. That's pretty common. I do have some one, two and four gig ones, but if we're going to do any kind of decent gaming, we're going to want a hard drive. So I've managed to pull some 1.8 inch hard drives out of some iPods, and then I had to test them. But maybe you can't get your hands on 1.8 inch hard drives. There's also compact flash cards and micro drives. So the 1.8 inch hard drives come in a 50 pin variety, as well as a ZIF or zero insertion force variety. Um, I've noticed that these don't go above 40 gigs, but they're more reliable than the ribbon cable or the flat flex cable ones. In fact, I have a thin client that has such low profile needs that I have to remove this male pin header and replace it with a female one in order to actually install a drive. I, I don't even have space for IDE cable. So the idea is we take out our disk on module, we replace it with either a 2.5 inch drive, a compact flash card in, or a micro drive in an IDE adapter, or an iPod drive. And then we got to figure out how to basically IDE origami, as I like to call it, into the unit. Okay, so if you notice, I had to, you know, fold and bend, and I also made sure to, or, to wrap the PCB. I'm going to wind up 3D printing a case so it's not just free floating. And remember, we have this extra shield plate that needs to go on top and over it. So, how do we get all this started? How are we going to get a legacy Windows 98 CD on an IDE CD-ROM drive on a device that won't accept one? So you're going to need a couple of tools. I used Easy to Boot, which wasn't exactly too easy. All right, that's how I installed it. I used Spinrite to check my drives. I used DBAN to clear them, uh, Derek's boot and nuke, and I used Gparta to partition drives. I also have a couple of other utilities that allow me to check the health of the various drives and whatnot, but it's a very long, arduous, and tedious process. Also, if you notice this guy, he's got that red circle in the middle. Well, that's because he used to be painted with like this butyl rubber or something like that. I've got a red one here that's also starting to like decay. If you hit that with some 91 or above isopropyl alcohol, IPA, uh, you, you and a little bit of elbow grease, that'll come right off. So now that you've managed to get yourself a micro drive, uh, 2.5 inch, 1.8 inch, how are you gonna test the drive? You, I mean, 
you don't know if it's going to natively work in the thin client, right? There's so many things that are going to go wrong, and there's so many things that it's not supposed to be doing that you're forcing it to do. I have this old janky junk laptop. I literally call it Franken laptop because it's missing a lot of parts. It took about four flights of concrete stairs. The hard drive took the blunt of the hit, but it still works. Well, if you can call that working, I basically just toss a drive in, throw D band, spin right, whatever utility, and then I just have it just test the drive for the next 78 plus hours. So, uh, you also would be wise to have one of these USB IDE bridges that can take 44 pin, but don't use them with disk on modules. They're not designed for it. Disk on modules are typically 3.3 volt with all kinds of not going to get into it right now, but don't do that. You may wind up damaging your um, your disk on modules. So let's go ahead and boot this guy up. It's going to take a little while. He's only sporting about an 800 megahertz processor. As you can see, I have installed a 20 gig iPod hard drive. And whenever I'm installing, like, any kind of new operating system legacy wise like this I actually and I'm using recycled drives like micro drive compact flash or an iPod drive I actually like to label the drive as such that way you know when I'm working with them if, if something's going wrong I know it's the, the drive is actually failing or whatnot I can specifically identify it by the drive label but yep She's, uh, she's chugging along, 512 megs of RAM. Now, as you can see, uh, right over here, there's a 512 meg SO DIMM. The difference between this model and this model is that this is locked to 64 megs of RAM strictly. There's no SO DIMM slot, so that's why this is all not sexy IDE origami yet. Keyword, yet. Gotta love that Windows 98 porn music. Now, one of the things that really surprised me was that after I've got this thing set up, I was able to run some um, some quick diagnostics on it, and it actually has some AGP capability. Yeah, Direct3D enabled. And I've also updated this to the latest versions of Direct3D, so this is uh, DirectX 7. Eight. And nine. So I'm really curious as to uh, what I can throw at this guy. I originally was expecting to just do some legacy DOS gaming sort of stuff, but I might be able to push some early Windows 98 gaming. So with that nostalgia in mind, let's go to the HP T5720 and the 30. A more modern update because they're running AMD Semperon processors, if I remember correctly, but we still have the issue of they're running 44-pin IDE. Notice that we've got DVI. We're actually using these guys as media centers for a while or, or torrent boxes and whatnot. They're not that terrible. But again, we have the issue of installing Windows 98, which does not have USB CD-ROM support, period. Like, it's doable. Easier to install XP or higher or any version of Linux. These things are pretty cool. Love to dig into them. They do run in the gigahertz range. I've got a couple of them. We'll get back to them another time. I'd really love to hear any feedback from anyone uh, pertaining any questions or comments because the more support and more more support, more feedback I get uh, based off of like the thin clients and whatnot. Because I'm just trying to briefly overview what I've been up to for about two and a half, three months right now, and I've. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you wanted to get in the thin client hackery, uh, it's always good to have, 
you know, a stockpile of old RAM. I've been collecting all sorts of old RAM from laptops for years, and it's really paid off. You're also going to need some standard 44-pin IDE cable. I usually get them pre-crimped. Here's a pro tip. If you'll notice that there's a notch at one end of them, okay, make sure that those notches are always in the same direction because your IDE cable may not be labeled with this red stripe as pin 1. Even if you're getting your own crimpable headers, okay, even if you're getting the ones that you're going to be doing yourself, okay, make sure you get that keyed header just so you yourself don't make that mistake. Although some IDE slots are hooded that are not keyed, so you may have to razor that off. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Fox's Law. Then you're going to wind up with a bunch of, you know, 44 pin IDE to compact flash, 44 pin to, you know, zero insertion force, you know, 1.8 inch hard drive. There are so many different types of drives to hook up to this thing. And then, of course, you're going to need your IDE origami skills in order to make sure that that thing fits. And this is. Just, you know, a collection of various headers. Notice, no keyway. So, yeah, I learned that lesson the hard way. And, of course, you're going to need a couple of thumb drives. By, by a couple of thumb drives, I mean a uh, whole buttload. <laughs> we'll get into the specifics later. If anyone's interested, just ask me some questions, and I'll be more than happy to comment. And this is a riser kit. This riser kit came right off of one of these guys. And it allowed us to install a fun, fun Wi-Fi card and a hard drive for shenanigans. Always shenanigans with us. Always shenanigans. Over here, let me grab this guy, is a Wise CX-0. He's a more modern of all of the Thin Client series, so I'm not going to be doing anything legacy with him. He's running a VIA C7 processor at about 1 GHz with a 2 gig disk on module and 2 gigs of RAM. Thanks to my good buddy Jeff, he mentioned that this looks like a Molex Pico blade connector. And when I went ahead and soldered that up and plugged in a USB thumb drive, everything worked easy peasy. 1, 2, 3, Z. So now we have an Athros Wi-Fi card with packet injection capabilities with an internal USB connector. So I'm basically going to screw off with the header and just disassemble the drive and basically pigtail this, heat shrink it, and tuck it inside. So that way you have a 2 gig disk on module inside as well as a 64 gig thumb drive internally. And that could make for a pretty good media center or a server or some kind of naughty tool. This is a much older Wise S10. I think this guy's running at like three or 400 megahertz. I don't think it can go above 512 megs of RAM, but one of the major problems with this guy is that his IDE bus does not support micro drives it just can't power them it doesn't have enough current whereas though the um the cx0 it will detect an ide cd-rom drive if it's externally powered this barely even runs a bios the, the there's about a 14 year difference between the two in fact this was a wise product dell actually now owns wise hence the color change but there are some really interesting things that you can do with these guys once you figure out how are you going to replace the operating system. This guy natively boots off of USB no problem. This guy boots off of USB natively no problem, but it's so old I don't know what to do with him. And this guy, I, I don't even know what he is. All I know is he came off of a CNC milling machine, has a, a clone x86 processor that clocks about 233 megahertz. I believe he has a 128 meg SO DIMM inside of him with USB 1.1. I, I, I just don't even know what to do with him. I'd love to get him to life, but I don't have much reason unless I get the support from everyone else out there. Let me know what your comments are. Let me know what your thoughts are. I would absolutely love to start digging into all of this legacy and modern thin client hackery 
because believe it or not, you know, we're living in such a disposable world today that, you know, we're throwing out these thin clients, not even wiping them. I can't tell you how many times that I've come across one of these thin clients over here and it turned out that I just automatically logs me into some lighting control s system somewhere, some place I shouldn't have been. Luckily these days when you get thin clients, they wipe the disk on modules, but it's really interesting going back and looking at the legacy hardware and trying to see what you can do with modern parts. So that was the whole point of this. I hope everyone enjoyed some, if not most of this. Uh, leave any comments, leave any feedback. I would really like to see if I can get some funding up and try to get a VGA capture box. So that way I can do a really in-depth, in-detailed tutorial on how I did this because there's really no way I can stand here and just hold a camera up to a screen the whole time and and make all of this happen. So if you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up, send me a comment, and ask me any questions that you may have. Um, I'm really curious as to what games that this thing can run and even more curious as to what level of emulation. Hmm.